I mean, we're taking innovation and we are absolutely applying the best technologies in the world to these issues that Bob just described. Most importantly, we're continuing to try to do everything in our power to inspire the best minds that I've ever met in my life to keep innovating around the things that we're doing. The next step of this opportunity is to invite someone to the stage that, that's going to be, for me, probably one of the most uh, moving opportunities in my career. I uh, got the chance to, to meet Nancy Frades. This was back maybe a month, month and a half ago. My daughter went to Boston College and we all knew Pete's story um, of AOS and how that all happened. And I got a chance to truly meet the person and what's behind the family, the Frades family, and what they've been able to achieve in raising over a quarter billion dollars for AOS. And they've done this, they've looked adversity in the eyes and they said, let's take it on as a family and as a complete community and it just spread around the world. So what I would like to do, um, we're gonna have a, um, a panel come up after Nancy makes her comments, but I'd like to um, introduce to you Nancy Frades, who is on a mission with her family to defeat AOS. She's a proud mom of Pete AOS patient advocate and inspiration for the AOS Ice Bucket Challenge, which has raised, as I mentioned, a quarter billion. She and her family have found their sense of purpose in working tirelessly to raise awareness around AOS and to stimulate funding for research. It's been 75 years since Lou Gehrig delivered his fair, famous farewell speech, and the only new drug and no new cure has been found. This, says Nancy Frades, is unacceptable. She did a TED Talk back I don't know, maybe a year or so ago, it's had over a million viewers. And the reason is, is that this is where the rubber meets the road. You can sit there and crumble when you're brought to your knees as a family around any issue that you might have. And health brings us to our knees as we all experience in our lifetimes. Nancy and her family and Pete are just angels trying to do something about ALS, which is just a devastating disease. So Nancy, Thank God you're here, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Bob Coughlin, my hat off to you. I couldn't have said a lot what you said any better. Um, amazing. So um, the first thing I'd like to do is just give you a quick overview of our story so I can kind of bring you up to date and then really um, dovetail it all to what you all really smart people are doing here. I'm probably the person with the least uh, amount of letters after their name that is in this room. Um, so our family was just like your next door neighbor. We were empty nesters. We had three kids graduate college. Um, one moved to Manhattan, one moved to South Boston, and one moved to Charlestown. Pretty much what happens here in Boston. And it was um, my middle son, Pete, when he was a little boy, he had a traumatic birth, as a matter of fact. He got staph infection as an infant. Um, he was born uh, the day before New Year's Eve, and at quarter of 12 on December 31st, 1984, I had two pediatricians walk in my room and tell me how sick my son was. He was less than 24 hours old, and he fought that infection off. It was in his blood system, and he fought that infection off. And I look back on those days, and I think to myself, number one, thank God for really smart doctors and people who um, care and come in, let their New Year's Eve party with their family and friends to come in and take care of my little boy. But number two, I saw a kid with grit and determination. This kid was chosen. He was chosen at birth. And as he went through his life, he was a leader. He was a servant leader. He was the best teammate you could ever have. Any of his friends will tell you, any of his teammates and classmates, they always looked up to him. Not because he was the best player on the field or the smartest kid in the classroom, but he was the one who was trying to make them be the best they could be. That's the ultimate teammate. And as he went into high school and college, he really excelled in, in sports. He played football, hockey, and baseball four years at St. John's Prep up on the North Shore, and then was recruited to Boston College to play baseball in the ACC. 
He had a tremendous year, graduated BC. MLB didn't come a calling, unfortunately. So he went to Europe and played in Europe and made friends and teammates all over Europe as he played baseball. And then, as I said, he came home, moved to South Boston, had a beautiful girlfriend and a job. And in August of 2011, I brought my family down to Florida. My daughter had just gotten married. And I said, I want that one last vacation before there are all these other people that are going to infiltrate into our family, right? And uh, during that vacation, Pete told me that he was going to quit his job. And I remember thinking to myself, OK, you live in South Boston. You have school loans. OK, why are you going to quit your job? And he tells me that he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Mom, I'm not passionate about what I'm doing. I'm supposed to be doing something else. And then he went back home. After we left Florida, we came back to Boston. And Pete was still playing baseball in the Intercity League in Boston. And during the championship game, Pete was up at the bat and got hit in the wrist. And his wrist went limp. And for the next six months, he said, don't worry about it, Mom. I'm going to the doctors. They're going to find out what's wrong with me. And on March 13, 2012, we went in to one of the most amazing hospitals in the world right here in Boston, went into a neurologist's office sat down and thought they were going to tell us he had a pinched nerve. And the doctor looked at us, an amazing doctor, a compassionate doctor. Believe me, in the last five and a half years, I know that determination now. <laughs> um, an amazing person who sat there and took his hand and said, Pete, we've put you through a lot of testing. Now we know it's not Lyme disease. We know it's not sprain. We know it's not infection. We know it's not MS. We know it's not lupus. And to this day, I remember seeing that hand go up and go up. And I'm thinking to myself, where is this guy going? And then he put his hands on his knees, and he looked right at Pete, 27 years old, and says, I don't know how to tell you this. You have ALS. Well, being a parent, my whole world changed in a second. Not only just because now I was dealing with my child have, being sick, right? It doesn't matter where on that level of sick he is. But you know what? I didn't know on the barometer of, of sick how sick he really was. Because I didn't know what ALS was. I knew it was bad. But I didn't know the context of what bad really meant. And I knew Lou Gehrig was 75 years ago. We were a baseball family. Well, 75 years, come on. We've, there's a lot of um, technology and improvements and innovations. And oh, yeah, this thing called the internet, right? It's got to be something. And then the second shoe dropped when that amazing doctor looked at us and said, Mr. and Mrs. Frades, I'm sorry to tell you. There's no treatment, no cure. Pete has two to five years to live. And it's 100% fatal. And then as we left the, di the diagnosis room and out to the receptionist with the doctor, I have to tell you, this was probably one of the worst moments in the journey. When we looked at the doctor and said, OK, well, when do you want to see him again? And he says, in three months. And I thought to myself, three months? You just told my 27-year-old kid he has two to five years to live. Let's put that in percentage of how long he has. Why, not, why don't you want to see him tomorrow? He's so sick. Mrs. Brady, I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do. And when he comes back in three months, we just want to check how far he's progressed. So that is our story. That was our journey. But our new journey started six hours after that was delivered. That's when my son, that servant leader, sat at a kitchen table with his sister and brother-in-law who came home from New York and his other brother, her brother who came home from Charlestown, Charlestown, his mom and dad, and his girlfriend, who he had only been dating for eight months and was a senior in college, came home. And we're all sitting around the table. And he looked right at us. And it's a word you've heard I don't know how many times in the 45 minutes I've been in this room already. The situation is un acceptable. If you come across a situation that's unacceptable, you have one of two choices. You can cower under it, 
or you can take it head on. And that's exactly what my son did. He looked at us and he gave us the charge. Six hours after diagnosis, he said a bunch of stuff, but the things that I remember the most are, we're not gonna look backward, we're gonna look forward. We're gonna change the trajectory of this disease. I'm gonna get this disease in front of philanthropists such as Bill Gates. I'm gonna get Major League Baseball to reignite its commitment to a disease named after one of its heroes. And then he said the words that I wake up to every morning and ring in my ear and put a smile on my face. What an opportunity we've been given to change the world. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was sitting there, there were a lot of words I would have used to describe that diagnosis. Opportunity wouldn't have been one of them. But I had a kid who had educated himself to the state of this disease, and he was determined to do something about it. So for the next two and a half years, we continued with Pete's vision. We marketed and branded a disease. We educated a whole new demographic to a disease that was named after someone in 1939. Now, in August of 2014, Pete, was already in a wheelchair, he had lost his ability to eat, and he had lost his ability to talk. So he was on a feeding tube and was using star, um, eye gazer technology to communicate. And because he's so present in his life, he identifies opportunity where others may have missed it. The Ice Bucket Challenge had been around for over a year prior to August of 2014. What's the difference? Pete saw it saw the opportunity, got strategic, and got purposeful. And during the month of August 2014, we hoped that you would open your hearts to our story, and you did. Facebook has reported 17 million ALS Ice Bucket Challenge videos were posted during the month of August 2014, viewed by 440 million unique viewers over 10 billion times. So we asked, and YouTube has reported that 150 different countries posted ALS Ice Bucket Challenge videos. So you opened your heart to your sto our story. Then we hope that you would open your mind to this disease, this unheard of, underfunded, and not included disease. And you did. Wikipedia between January 1st and July 31st, 2014, the ALS page was hit on an average of 164,000 times uh, a month. August 2014, the ALS page was hit over 3 million times. So you opened up and you learned about this disease. Well, then we hoped you'd open your wallets. And as Kevin said, in six weeks, we raised over $225 million for a disease that was so grossly underfunded. But more importantly, we woke up the world to the reality of a disease that had been in the shadows too long. So I'd like to just put it in the context of precision health and, and talk a little bit about how important it is in our disease, but how challenging it is. Right now, I will tell you that um, the Ice Bucket Challenge funds are funding about three to four different collaborative big data precision um, medicine studies in our disease. Now, why is this so important, especially in our disease, and why is it so challenging? Well, the first is that when you turn and you look at that doctor and say, why does my kid have this disease? They can't give you a reason. Now, of course, one of the things is what you've been talking about a lot here, CTEs. Yes, Pete had concussions. He had one that was so bad that he had to be hospitalized for it. And you know what? Out of football, hockey, and baseball, it was in baseball that he got the worst concussion, which I think people, you know, that takes him back a little bit. 
But in our disease also, when you're, when you're given the diagnosis, 10% of the people who get an ALS diagnosis pretty much know they're going to get it because it's familial, coming down in the, in, the, um, in the families. And if it's in your family, it is devastating. It attacks 50% of a generation. I have seen familial charts with X's through all the people in their family that has died. But the other 90% of us, the other 90% of us, our diagnosis, you know what the term is? Sporadic. I, I didn't even know that was like a medical term. Sporadic. Mrs. Frades, he has sporadic ALS. OK. So that's a challenge. We don't know why people get it. The diagnosis. Unfortunately, our disease is still a diagnosis of elimination. So that clatter climbing, right? That was the doctor saying, well, we tested this, we tested that, and just getting that. And then, of course, you talk about painful, evasive, expensive testing. Has anyone ever seen an EMG performed? It is absolutely devastating. And the other thing is, is that it's a, it, we only can conclude ALS uh, post-mortem. So you have this diagnosis problem in that not only are the brightest minds who are in neurology, specifically in, L uh, in ALS, challenged to diagnose it, but I will tell you, I have found people throughout this country and talked to so many ALS patients that never get diagnosed or have surgery. I talk to people who have had their spines opened up, have had shoulder surgery when their arm went weak. So this awareness campaign that we have been on and that we continue on is not just for moms and dads and daughters and sons, but also for, for doctors, GPs, neurologists, to put this disease back on the table and take note of it. Another challenge is our clinical trials. Our cl clinical trials are, are just very, very hard and difficult to, um, to monitor and to also to populate because our disease, no two ALS patients are alike. When you get diagnosed with ALS and they tell you to come back in three months, they have no idea when you walk back in in three months how far you've progressed because different rates of progression. And you look at the doctor and you walk in and they're like, okay, well, we're going to test Pete to see what he can and what he can't do. And meanwhile, someone who was diagnosed on the exact same day is either better off, it hasn't progressed as much, or is worse. So in a clinical trial to have cohorts, and that's why the precision model is so important in our disease, to try to track, you know, get the same people, like people, to get these um, clinical trials to help with... Um, with the data, our measuring tools in ALS. And I'm a lay person. I am not a doctor. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a researcher. But from my point of view, from being a mother of a patient, these measuring tools, this ALS FRS, it's so subjective that the data is, is not objective at all. This is the ALS FRS. It's a questionnaire that the patient fills out. Now, let's think about this. You have a disease. I don't know if we have any ALS patients in this room, and if we do, I'm, I'm you know, just talking to try to get this, the emphasis of what, this is, what we go through. But you get a questionnaire as the patient. OK, a rate from 1 to 5, your arm movement, your leg movement, your ability to speak. Now, try to get into the mind, and believe me, as a mother, I'm probably as close to the mind of an ALS patient as you can possibly get. But you know what the end game is here. So do you think when you're ranking yourself from one to five that you're going to put, where do you think you're going to rank? You're going to rank the least possible number that you can. It's just human nature. The other one is an FVC, force vital capacity, which is unfortunately the terminal part of ALS when they can no longer breathe anymore. They take, it looks like a kazoo. 
and puts them in their mouth and they tell them to, to breathe into it so they can measure the force vital capacity. Well, there are so many problems with that. The first being how tight can someone put their mouth around this uh, mechanism that kind of, um, you know, looks like I said, looks like a kazoo. And the other thing is, is that the person who's giving the test will look at the result and say, oh, you can do better than that. Let's do it again. <laughs> so we do it again. I sat in a room once where they literally left the room for a half an hour and came back in and had Pete do it three more times. So our measuring tools are very, um, like I said, they're faulty at, at best. Care versus cure. I think that's a huge one in our, in our world. The Ice Bucket Challenge was all about funding for a cure. Right now, we're battling the care. And like Bob was saying, you know, the expense to have my son home right now. Pete has been on a ventilator for three years. He virtually has lost all muscle movement other than a little bit in his face. He calls himself the bionic man because he lives on machines. But the other point is, is as this disease progresses, you know, I'll give you the visual that I went to bed with the night that Pete was diagnosed. Remember, now I'm really dating myself. Back in the 80s, Pac-Man, the little yellow Pac-Man. I went to bed at night, and all I could think of was that little yellow Pac-Man rummaging through my son's body. And every morning, I would wake up and wonder what Pac-Man took away from my son and what we were going to face that day. Because ALS patients grieve every day. Could it be the day that Pete walked in the house at 28 years old with a set of keys and did a mic drop with his keys, knowing he was never going to be able to drive a car again. So the problem, again, another challenging piece in our, in our, um, in our world is this preventive medicine. Because these milestones now have to be met with treatments, but the patients meet these milestones with denial and anger. Catfish Hunter, the um, Hall of Fame um, baseball pitcher, he had ALS. I don't know if a lot of people know that. Did Catfish Hunter die of ALS? Well, I would say yes. But Catfish Hunter was losing his ability to walk and didn't want to get in that, that um, wheelchair. I know what that is. My, my, husband and my son would walk with Pete with his arms because Pete didn't want to go in the wheelchair because they know once they go in the wheelchair, they're never getting out. It's like a defeat for them. Well, Catfish Hunter fell down a flight of stairs and hit his head because he didn't want to give in to that milestone. He died a month after he fell from a brain bleed. And the other thing is, is that our symptoms end up mimicking other diseases. So Pete has an ALS doctor. He has a general practitioner. He has a urologist. He has a pulmonologist. He has an infectious disease doctor. He has a, a psychologist. And there are a bunch of problems that come with that. But the first one being is that when he needs a drug for a symptom, we didn't know which doctor to call. And then if we called the wrong doctor, they wouldn't prescribe it because it was out of the realm of what they're supposed to do. The other thing is, is that um, Pete, when he um, gets all this pneumonia and this infection, it mimics CF, like Bob's son. So Pete has been put on a CF drug. But because the FDA approved it for CF and not for ALS, it's considered open label. And it costs our family $3,000 a month to keep Pete on that drug, which we will gladly do. But I just want to take this last minute to talk about the good news in going forward. So funding, the Ice Bucket Challenge was a start, and it is continuing. During the last two years, good news, people like you, for data, we have four new genes, and the biomarkers are coming at a really swift pace right now. Are we collaborating? That was another incredibly um, unacceptable situation that we found ourselves in. We are collaborating like you can't believe right now. 
Project Mine um, and Dr. John Landers out at UMass Medical when they found the gene. That was an international collaboration. We have a change of mindset in our disease, and this has a lot to do with precision medicine. People aren't dying from ALS anymore. They're living with ALS. Because we're using treatments for like CF, because we're, get, we're educating people that you can live with assistive technologies and getting the right um, medications that will help with your symptoms, you can actually live with it. The discoveries, we have, they are the result of a movement that was 2014. And in August of this year, we had our first effective treatment approved by the FDA, Radicava. Radicava, and I get myself in trouble sometimes. Again, I'm not a doctor, but from what I understand in early diagnosis, it helps slow the progression down by 33%. Now, that might, that might not be true. We're still working on the data of it, but I'll tell you this. Remember when I said the worst day of my life was when we walked to that receptionist and they told me not to come back for three months because there was nothing they could do. The ALS diagnosis right now should be come back tomorrow. We have an infusion drug to put you on that has shown effectiveness in early diagnosis. And the disruption, the disruption of the ice bucket challenge. We disrupted the ALS space. We disrupted philanthropy. We disrupted social media and we disrupted the FDA because that drug was approved in the United States without any US data. They used the clinical trial data from Japan. And Janet Woodcock told us at an advocacy meeting that she heard us. <laughs> so I ask you, please hear us. Put ALS in your conversations, in your boardrooms, and on your lab bench. Disrupt. It is our time. Thank you for your work you do. I can't tell you how grateful patient advocates are for people like you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nancy. Awesome job. You're going to stay up here for the talk. Yeah,